hello. Because, yeah, we haven't done an overview about interprocedural optimizations for a long time on which we tend to spend um, quite some time. It's of particular interest to us. I thought that it would be a nice idea to do it again here at Labs Conference. And uh, yeah, probably believe that all of you know that the interprocedural IPA for short uh, transformations or optimizations are those that are interprocedural, which means that they look at multiple uh, functions as they are being compiled at a time and uh, that you know, these are now really necessary to reduce the abstraction penalty of modern software, meaning mostly modern C++ software, but frankly, some of them are important for any big projects. And uh, so let's start. When we look at what the optimization pipeline or actually the compilation process uh, of uh, modern GCC is, you start with the source file, that's something that you write or generate with some fancy code generator, and you feed that into a front end, which is something that can grok the language. That can be a C front end, C++ front end, Go front end, Ada front end, Fortran front end, uh, Brick front end actually even. And now we also, I believe we also have a D front end, so there are plenty of those. But then there's a lot of stuff that you um, you know, that, that they want to simplify, optimize, speed up, reduce in size, and so forth, so you need to run some optimizations on them. Um, after you do that, you give all that to the specific backend, which then generates the assembly code for your selected target. Um, now, it, this image might suggest that uh, everything before backend is actually target independent. That is definitely not the case. Throughout the whole process, uh, the various other components of the compiler query the backend, so the front end already has to know how big an integer is uh, how, um, when you're you know, in, in the process of op optimizations, such as when you're doing, for example, things like vectorization. Uh, that uh, pass has to know how big the vectors are, right? Whether it makes any sense uh, to try and vectorize any particular loop. And uh, so, you know, everything is pretty much uh, very backend specific. But we will mostly concentrate on one specific part of uh, the optimization pipeline, which sits in the middle of uh, the generic optimization pipeline, that is generic to a big extent. And uh, that does the truly interprocedural uh, optimizations, which means that these are passes that are not fed one function, but they actually operate on the whole call graph. They look at all the functions, all the variables, all the symbols, see what the relations between them are, see what their properties are, and then make decisions how to transform uh, the whole compilation in it, or even the whole, whole program, we'll get to that later, um, to make it faster and smaller. Now, but before those are run, we actually do have um, a pipeline of what we call early optimizations, which is which will be important later on in my talk, because what happens is before these IPA uh, analyses uh, see the your function, see your code, or at, at least the intermediate representation of it, um, it has already been simplified quite a bit. There has already been a constant propagation, value range propagation and analysis, uh, a lot of uh, debt store elimination, debt code elimination, and quite a bit of simplification has already happened, which means that a lot of abstraction at the level of individual uh, functions, and a little bit more, I'll get to that later as well, has already been done. Another important aspect of this division is that it allows for link time optimizations, which is an uh, important um, <laughs> technique, how to get much more context and how to really optimize your whole program. Traditional compilation process looks like this. I believe that you are all used to it and use it every day. You have multiple source, co source uh, files. You run them through GCC to get an object file. And this object file, of course, has basically binary instructions, not relocated, but that's basically what it is. And you use linker to get at your final executable. At link time optimization, uh, things are, you know, we, when you want to uh, work with the whole program, whole program, 
the representation of the object files is not ideal. There is really not so much that you can do when all you have already are the individual instructions. You can do a little bit, like, you know, for example, c++.com.handling is basically a linker type optimization, uh, but you can, you know, you need something else uh, to do really powerful optimizations on the whole program, and that's why we use LTO. The, from the user perspective, it looks almost the same. What happens is that you have your source files, and you run GCC on them with FLTO option, and they also produce .o files, but these .o files have sometimes only, sometimes in addition to normal object uh, output, also intermediate language, which is an intermediate representation of your uh, compilation unit. And uh, Linker realizes, wait, wait a minute, this is not, you know, th this is not finished. I need to do something about it, and it invokes an LTO plugin, uh, which is a dynamically loaded shared object, but you know, its source resides within the GCC project. The GCC, uh, or the LTO plugin, then invokes another um, another executable that does the serial whole program analysis phase. And this is the only serial phase uh, when it comes to the link time optimization uh, paradigm uh, that there is. The, the uh, source files are compiled into intermedi intermediate language by make in parallel. And then what happens when the whole program analysis is done and it is, you know, made its decisions what to do, it then partitions the program uh, in a way that may or may not resemble uh, your original division into compilation units. And these are then um, compiled from the intermediate language into a real object file in parallel as well. This is then ba fed back to the linker and the linker comes out with uh, your executable. How does this map into the optimization pipeline or mm, of of uh, optimizing a program. Uh, yeah, you can see it on this slide. Basically, the front end, obviously, parsing your sor source file. And even the early optimizations are done as part of what the user thinks of as the compilation, the, with how, how the .o files are produced. Then, at the end, the interprocedural passes also gather li little bits of information. They really try to you know, not uh, gather too much information, because this is then fed into the IPA in the yellow square, and it's yellow because, and, it, and it's both in the yellow square and the red square because from the user perspective, it looks like linking, but it is the only serial, uh, serial phase. It is done in a different executable, and therefore it's different. And this IPA then works on the call graph and on these little bits, uh, bits of information to make various decisions, which are when everything is then passed into the late passes, which do the rest of the compilations as normal code generation and so forth. And you get, at the end, uh, an assembly file that is fed into an assembler, which uh, the out and the output of that is then fed into the linker again and again at your executable. One thing that is very important with LTO and that people often don't realize is that uh, what we, do, we do symbol promotion which means that symbols that in, in that in traditional way of compiling things would have external linkage, they would be visible to the final linker, um, now can be made local. In C-speak, that basically means that things become magically static. And that means that we have them much more under our control, especially if their address is not taken. And if their address is not taken, or if we can remove all these uh, <laughs> taking address um, statements from it as parts of early optimizations, which often happens, uh, then uh, we can play with the symbol. We can, we can remove it, we can change the calling convention, we can change the ABI, and so forth. And uh, um, yeah, all of this is done with precise information from Linker, there's no guessing, and it even works for C++ com dots as long as stuff is not, has, does not have its address taken which simplifies dynamic linking greatly because before that, you know, wh when C++ com that is privatized, that means that then shared object library, for example, does not have its own copy as another shared object library, and all these symbols do not have to be resolved and dealt with. They are private and, you know, they don't affect linking. So let's look at some more advanced IP optimizations. Another one that people often do not realize is very important and especially important with LTO, and is one of the biggest benefit of LTO, is unreachable code removal. I mean, if you imagine that you have a code like this, 
um, you have a loop that loops up to some limit, and if, you, if your index is over 64, you call some other function. If early optimizations can figure out that the limit is smaller than or, or, or equal to 64, that in knows 65 even, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that it knows that the handle big index is never called, and because because everything in that if can be removed. Now, if even without LTO, if you were diligent and you made that other function static, uh, it would know that it can be removed. Of course, if it's not called from somewhere else, the address is not taken, it's not marked as necessary with a special attribute, and so on and so forth. But if, if this is the reason why the function was needed, it would still be removed. But you know, fairly often what happens is that the source code is actually looks like this. And without symbol promotion, you would not be able to remove that uh, handle big index function. Another, this is a reasonably obvious, uh, but this is actually even more important when this call here uh, gets inlined. If the function is mm, public, and so it can be a normal compilation called from outside of the compilation unit, even if you inline this call, it uh, cannot remove the offline copy. But if you, with LTO, and we, and we know the symbol is local, we, we can, and we know that we have inlined all calls, we can remove the offline copy. What is more, in this, in this case, the inliner even knows, well, wait, this is the only call. We know if we inline it, we know the code will not grow. Let's just do it under some certain other set of conditions. So it really makes uh, code smaller. And especially, you can imagine, in C++ heavy templated input, where C++ template expansion results um, into a lot of stuff that in the end is not really necessary and needs to be cleaned up. And sometimes it's not really you know, in an anonymous namespace, so it's not static in C++, it's not static in the C-speak. So LTO is really effective there. So much so that, for example, in a spec uh, parest benchmark, the size of the text uh, section of the ELF drops to 22%. I've just measured it a couple of minutes ago. Um, of non-LTO built, so you save 80% of code, and it's mostly due to the removal of unreachable code. Um, the size of the whole executable is about 37%, so you know when you do an update, you only have to fetch 37% of the data that you had before. And um, uh, text size of Firefox is now approximately 89% of the non-LTO variant, and again, this is mostly to the unreachable code removal. How this is done? Well, it's fairly simple. Uh, what we do is that we start with uh, things that have to be reachable, like function main or, or something that you can call uh, from outside of the shared object, like for example, in the, you know, here, the function f1. And we look at what is reachable. So if in early optimizations, for example, we figure out, you know, we can remove this edge, it's never called, then, uh, the situation is like this, and from the reachable node, we walk uh, the call graph. So if F1 calls F2 and F3, we mark them as necessary, as required. F2 calls F4, mark them as, as necessary, required. Well, we'll see what's left, it's these three, and so just you remove them. It's no, there's nothing magical about the algorithm, but you can only do it if you have the infrastructure in place. So let's move on to another interprocedural uh, and, and slightly less obvious pass, and that is automatic discovery. Um, in when you're dealing with optimization um, of code in a compiler, pure and const, and even malloc and no return attributes can be very handy, can be very very important. But um, you know, programmers are sometimes lazy and they don't annotate their functions with all the attributes that need to be, uh, you know, that, 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 that are useful. Uh, const, by the, const function, by the way, if you don't happen to know, means that the function uh, only calculates its results, it doesn't look at memory, and it only does that from its arguments. Uh, pure means that it can read memory. Uh, malloc means that it behaves like malloc, basically, if, if, if 
look it up, the definition if you want to, it's slightly complicated. No return means that this function does not return, like panic in kernel, for example, is a no return function. Um, and uh, what happens is that, you know, it is fairly easy, at least for, you know, these four to discover when you see, uh, see the function uh, from the compiler perspective to see, okay, this is a pure function, it, it doesn't load memory, uh, I mean, const function, it doesn't load memory, it only works on, 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 on its, uh, on its parameters, but then the information is really useful outside of uh, that function. It is useful um, in the context of the caller, and so you need to interprocedurally um, propagate that information, and again, transitively. So if f4 is discovered to be a const function, and then f3 would be const, but on its own, but it also calls f4, then if f4 is, con f4 is const, F3 is, f3 is const, uh, again, if f1 would be const on its own, except that it relies on f2, f3, which we have already discovered our const, we can propagate it uh, and, and declare f1 const as well. Um, perhaps the most important bit uh, of this, uh, or the, the most important use of this, however, is the propagation of a node row, uh, which, as you can see on the slides, can really save a lot of cleanup regions in Firefox. Um, and uh, that you know saves time, but it mostly saves code, and uh, again is another reason why the size of the executable drops with LTO. If you would like to be diligent programmers, you can try suggest minus w suggest attribute warning that will tell you why well, you can declare this function pure if you if you really wanted to for non-LTO builds elsewhere or if you have other uses, or if you're just interested. Uh, similar propagation of information is done for profile. Uh, the basic usage is that regions that are calling cold code, like uh, abort, which usually doesn't happen, probably shouldn't, uh, so that so it's a cold region, and if something calls a function that just calls abort, that something is probably also a cold region as well. So something similar is done with profile information. Um, and, and then by profile information, we mean the guest profile information, what we believe is actually the profile. The measured profile, of course, is measured. Identical code folding is a pass, uh, one of the more magical ones that Martin Lischka wrote um, from our department. <coughs> Excuse me. And what it does, in, it, it looks for functions that are exactly the same. It works with LTO, so they can come up, uh, they can come from different compilation units, and uh, merges them. So if it sees fu function bar one and bar two that do exactly the same thing, it can say, okay, uh, this code doesn't have to be duplicated, I can make one alias of the other, symbol alias, and just have the function there just once. Because it is done at the intermediate language level, at, at the uh, and at the compiler level, where we see the uh, entire call graph, we can also look at functions that are identical if they also call functions that are actually identical, otherwise they wouldn't be. And um, like in this example, for example, you know, foo1, foo2 do the same things, but they call two different functions, but if, do two, if those two different functions are identical, then uh, foo1 and foo2 are identical as well, semantically, and could be, could be um, merged. And so that is being done. The difference in this one is that they're not static, and let's assume that you know, their address can be taken, which is a problem, because in C, uh, if you take address of two functions and you then compare them, they have to look different. They cannot be the same thing. So if you just merge them in an alias, it wouldn't work. And so in the final assembly, what happens is that we basically generate a ta tail call. We from foo one, no, from foo two, we would just jump directly to foo one and be done with it. Um, the algorithm is fairly simple. Uh, on <laughs> at least on, you know, it can, f the, the idea can fit on one slide. Of course, uh, the devil is in the details and there are very many when, when you know, you try to uh, figure out that two functions are really semantically identical. <coughs> but basically, at the compilation stage, um, we calculate a fingerprint of each function and uh, basically hash, 
And if two functions have the same hash, which shouldn't happen, the hash contains uh, the parameters, the shape of the control flow graph, uh, various types, and so on and so forth. But if the hash is identical, it can still happen that the, that the functions are actually a little bit different. So we are able to bring in the bodies uh, in the serial stage even and compare them properly there. And that they also, um, when, when that test is passed, we can check that the functions that they call, the corresponding functions that they call, are also semantically identical. And uh, then we declare them uh, we declare them the same. But of course, if we figure out that F3 and G3, for example, in this, uh, on this slide, um, are, you know, they, they look identical, but they look functions which unfortunately are not identical, then we have to separate them and just leave them be and not merge them. And then, of course, if these functions have some callers, we have to iterate, we have to continue, we have to uh, split mm, also F2 and G2, and then eventually, unfortunately, even F2 and G1, because because of the leaf function, bec because the leaf functions are different, the whole chains are different. But of course, if it happens that there are functions H1, H2, H3, and H4, which all are fine, all, all are doing the same thing, that we are able to, um, um, unify these pairs. Propagation of stuff, uh, that's mostly, um, you know, I've done a lot of work in that area. The path that does it is called interprocedural constant propagation for historical reasons, uh, mostly because it started as a propagator of constants. Um, this is the simplest possible example. I have a bunch of functions that all call function g, and they all pass one as the parameter. So it just makes sense if we have control over g, if it is a local symbol in, in our compilation context, um, to change g, uh, make it something that doesn't take any parameter, and just know that the, that the parameter was one. Often what happens is that you have a bunch of functions, and some of them call g, with a constant. And at the time, you have to figure out what you want to do, whether whether one is really important or not. But let's assume that it is something important, like uh, loop stride. So in, when you advance pointers, by how many elements in array you advance a pointer in a loop, that is something very, very important by vec for vectorization. If you, if you know that is a constant, and especially if it's one, then you know that's really, really great. Uh, so perhaps you want to duplicate G and I have a one version for uh, context which pass constant one, and another one, the original one, for the rest of these con uh, rest of the contexts. <coughs> and IPACP is exactly the thing that does that and can clone, and uh, it again works, it traverses whole call graph. So if the situation is only very slightly different, we have a function f f zero that passes one to f one, which then just takes this value and passes it to G, the, the pass knows, oh, this is one. The thing that, that is passed from F1 to, 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 to G is one, and it knows that it can use the specialized function for this call context as well. But IPACP is called constant propagation really for historical reasons. It tracks and propagates many other things. Uh, constants are the obvious example and the first example. It even can pass constants passed by reference and pass and parts of bigger aggregates, at least to some, even though the discovery, of course, is very complicated, and so it's rather limited to simple cases, but it still can be useful. Uh, polymorphic call contacts for devirtualization and speculative devirtualization. Basically, if we know what polymorphic type, what class with virtual functions we're passing in a parameter, then we can devirtualize the calls inside the callee. Uh, and uh, any call that uh, is direct as opposed to you know an indirect call, which who knows what, what, what calls uh, is a much better one than the indi indirect version. And so what we can even do is speculative uh, devirtualization, which means that we introduce a runtime test. Is this the type that we think it is? And uh, if it is, then we do a direct call. If it isn't, we do an indirect call. Uh, this on its own, 
Um, this is not done on its own, even though it would be technically possible. Uh, but in conjunction with inlining, <coughs> where we inline the direct call, um, it is often very, very useful because C++ has many, many very small functions. And if you can inline those, it is a big win. We also propagate other things like value ranges, and uh, which means you know this this variable uh, has values from zero to sixty-four, mm, or the most useful value range is a negative one. This pointer is not null. That's like really really super useful, and the most common. And uh, which bits can be non-zero? So if you have an integer, oh, we know that it has been. Uh, I think that it's actually which bits must be zero. <laughs> which get which bits? Yeah, no. Which bits can be non-zero, right? So, so basically, in other words, which other bits must be zero? So, uh, if the two mm, least significant bits are have to be zero, that you know what an alignment of a pointer, for example, is. Phases of the constant propagation, we summarize behavior of various functions. We see what what their properties are, uh, how they pass. Mm, values from their own parameters to the functions that they call, and also how specific values of parameters affect the function. So uh, if we know that if a pointer is null, a big chunk of the function is not, uh, not performed, that we know that when we clone it, this thing does not count. And uh, so we have these predicates that see how various things uh, are affected by, for example, constantness of parameters. And uh, then we propagate known values from the callers to the callees. So on, on, on my slides, it would, on my examples, it's always top to bottom. Um, then we also have, uh, when, when we do it, when we arrive at some constant context, we calculate what we think are the effects, how, how uh, the function would look like if it, had, if it was called in this known particular call context, and uh, store it along with the node. And then, um, Propagate these estimations from callees to callers, so that we know that if we cop if we propagate this constant for <coughs> the, you know al along this many calls, then uh, we would be able to uh, then this would have this this benefit, and then we do a final sweep through the call graph, and uh, and uh, we uh, make the decisions. The one of the latest useful examples is this one again in conjunction with inlining. Uh, this is from MCF uh, spec 2017 um, benchmark, where it spends a lot of time in quicksort, and that quicksort is called from two different mm, places of the benchmark. And uh, but two, <laughs> those two different places use different comparators, right? Uh, different functions to compare the actual elements that are being sorted, and it would be really super useful to inline those uh, compare functions directly into quicksort, but there are two of them, so it's not really possible. And so what constant propagation is able to do, uh, it is able to clone quicksort, um, each one with its own known comparator function, which, which can be inlined into quicksort, and this brings about uh, at least 10%. Which uh, when we don't do one of them, uh, the performance drops down to 10%, so if you do this, we gain 10% of performance on an important benchmark. Which brings me to inlining, which is perhaps the most important interprocedural optimizations there is, uh, because of the calls mm, removes all of the abstractions that are imposed by the call. But there is not too much to talk about, unfortunately. It is uh, just a greedy algorithm that picks candidates from a heap as long as there are some candidates, or as long as the total global limits on the growth of the, you know, uh, whole program in LTO mode or a compilation unit in non-LTO mode is reached, or until it is reached. And, um, and uh, it you know, always picks the best and just inlines it and picks th then the second best and inlines it, updates um, the, the weights of the candidates along the way. Um, it updates uh, these, uh, it uses the call context uh, effects information that I described when I was talking about IPACP. Uh, they, those are actually shared. Um, the inlining metrics, how we measure goodness of a candidate, or badness rather, is saved execution times, 
times frequency measured or estimated de depending on whether you're doing whether you're uh, measuring your profile or whether it is just guessed by the compiler divided by function growth and uh, times total growth where if there is no total growth if if if, if uh, that's basically only we actually save the call because that's the last invocation of the functions so 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 Go total growth does uh, the uh, the code in total does not grow. Uh, that is one, and that's plus some special points for making call direct, which I already said was important. New constant iteration count, new constant stride discovered. Uh, we talked about that, uh, mm, and some penalties for recursive calls because mm, they are not that useful. And cross module inlining because we believe that people put into the same modules things that relate to each other. Um, but that's really it. It's, it's a simple greedy algorithm. Um, there is a size limit for inlining candidates. Uh, so it's softer for functions marked inline, uh, which means that you sometimes should be careful with marking functions inline, especially in C++ when you like to write your code directly into the class definition. Uh, that is an inline declaration and can, can mean that a uh, compiler really thinks that it's a good, thing, good, good idea to inline it. And for functions where we estimate, and we are very confident that it will be sped up by over 15%, and we are, we are more lenient. Um, there is also an early inlining, which actually runs as part of the early optimizations. It looks as, as all the functions a function calls, and if it is clear that it is a good idea to inline it, it is a getter function from C++ that just loads uh, something and returns it. Uh, then we inline it, and it really saves tons of levels of abstraction very, very early, and it is important to be able to analyze the functions in early optimization. And uh, one final thing about inlining is that inlining big programs is fairly hard. And uh, so you can help the compiler, you can look at what it is doing, what it should be doing. If you, de if you have a function declared inline and it's not, declar not, not inline, uh, you can get a warning if you want. You can also look have a with the f opt info inline parameter. You can have a deeper look at what it does. We can also remove unused parameters. So if a parameter that's just never used, like we do have in GCC, that can be removed. And uh, this slides there is a parameter that is not unused, but you cannot see it. It is this pointer of the C++ uh, C++ mm, function method, and. Um, that is removed, it, it eff effectively becomes a static method, but you don't have to worry about it as a programmer. Uh, don't have time for this, unfortunately, but the slides describes that even in a recursive call, when two or three or many functions just pass a parameter one to, each, one to another, and uh, they're all useless, they're just used to be passed to the, to the next functions, that can be removed, or will be able after I commit in the afternoon the new version of IPS R8. And uh, when I commit it, we will also be able to remove return values that are not used, and even transitively. So if you have a visit statement function that, um, that, uh, is, uh, that returns a value and it carefully calculates that value, but no user actually wants it, it can remove, you know, it, it can make it a void function and, and, and also make all of those functions that are necessary to calculate the return function void functions and just forget about the return values there and save some code and hopefully some time. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, I'm, because of the problems with the projector, I'm running out of time. Uh, the rest of my slides, which will be put up somewhere on the website, uh, show how the propagation is done. Basically, we look at, look at things and um, if a function does not need a return value to remove it, if it only needs it to, to return it and uh, its callers don't need it, then return it. In recursive regions, we just have to iterate a little bit so that when we discover something is needed, uh, we then mark everything as needed, very, very necessary. Uh, I'm sorry to go through this very, very quickly. Um, we can also split a uh, big aggregate, aggregate um, arguments. So the argument point P can be just replaced with the thing that is actually used in the function. And we can do it when uh, that is passed by reference as well, and at least in some certain conditions, under some certain conditions. And uh, that's everything. So sorry for probably wasting the time for your questions, but I believe there is a break. So if you are really interested in something, we can talk either now. Three minutes. Oh, you do? Okay, 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 okay. Right, so we have time for a question or two. Or I can go back and just.
Can you go to slide 12, please? Let's see. Which one is it? I don't, don't see them here. Now? Well, yeah. yeah. Why should we annotate functions by const or pure? I think you can detect it rather easily in compiler or not. Uh, yes. Uh, one reason is that if you are not using the LTO mode of compilation for some reason, and your uh, you have the functions in one compilation unit and the calls in another compilation unit, then there is no communication channel unless you write it in directly into the header file. But you can detect the information directly from the ah oh the caller doesn't know unless if it's not an LTO if, if it's not in an, uh, if we're not doing an LTO. Got it. Got if, it. Thank you. If you compile the caller and call you separately, they don't have other ways of communication other than what the user provided. It seems like when you were describing uh, the analysis to def decide if a two functions were uh, basically the same, there was a lot of analysis with that. Um, is there anything to say? Well, these are like very much the same, therefore let's reuse these parts and uh, you know, basically to reduce your code no, size. No, no. <coughs> the, these, um, our pass works at the function granularity, um, mainly because you either get an alias or this. We don't, don't share bits of functions. We, we, we don't outline bits of functions, basically. Um, what can, what can would there, there is another method how to do identical code folding and that's like really at the linker binary level. And there you, w when you have, for example, instantiation of a vector of pointers uh, to object A of class A and vector of pointers to class B, at the assembly levels, they look uh, exactly the same because the pointer is just a pointer. But of course, at, at the in, in the intermediate language for uh, various reasons, uh, it, they are not the same, so we don't merge them, and, and, and Linker can. Okay, it just seems like it's an opportunity that maybe, w in my estimation, would would you know re reduce code size for a lot big programs. Uh, by uh, pro a yeah, amount. probably. You know, outlining of the of the, of the common uh, areas, I, I think the challenge there would be the complexity of analysis. How how, how do you find the areas that you want to compare, whether they are identical? But yeah, does it work? But at the same time, you do partial splits, right? So you can apply ICF on top of this. Could you? Yes, 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 yes. So what happens is that is that, and that's that's true. There is one another of the um, optimizations which happens as part of the early optimizations. Uh, but when you have a function, some we can split it into two. Basically, when you have a function that does a big check at the beginning and then either does nothing or a lot of stuff, it m makes sense to split them into the check and the lot of stuff so that the check can be in line. Um, and the, a lot of stuff would be compared separately by this pass from the check. So, so if, if, if one of them is, well, the, 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 the a lot of stuff, if it's the same, uh, then, then everything would be uh, also uh, folded. All right. Um, so yeah, sorry for the issues with the projector. I'll, of, 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 I was quite sure it would not happen this time, but thank you very much. <laughs>